Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to have the talk by Juliet Dieto. And that is on the geometry of hypercalar manifolds. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for coming and for the introduction. So, yes, today I want to discuss, uh, well, in these uh, two seminars, the first part is introduce the main ingredients of the, of the second talk. So, basically, it's to mention what are hyperfeather manifolds, what are the case of, of the, the two-dimensional uh, case, yes, so surfaces or case to surfaces, the main properties of KT surfaces that can also obtain it for a higher dimension that are the hypercalers. And there are other properties that that, uh, that doesn't come very free graphs. So the point is to try to generalize and how to, to get it for also for, for this special variety. And then, the, and this is particular when it's the theoretical material I, I will mention here. So, um, it's plenty of examples, so please do many of these many questions because maybe yeah, there are some stuff that I just do skip. It. But uh, if you have some questions, just tell me. Okay. So firstly, I want to say that this is over the setting of the complex numbers. Okay, and varieties here are well, or manifolds in this case. Uh, are coming for a uh, with a complex. They are complex, compact, okay, smooth, of dimension two n. Okay, so what is an uh, key with surfaces? Because the story start like uh, try to generalize some properties of in the setting of surfaces to higher dimension. So a KT surface, so will be under this setting, a complex compact smooth surfaces, okay? Such that admitting two properties. So the first one that is a simple connection, means that the fundamental group is radial. And the second condition is that um, there exists an holomorphic uh, anolomorphic to form it's denoted later such that it's non degenerate in particular generate this part of the, the composition as a color manifold. Uh, sorry, so let's call it omega. Omega C if not with you. And then the and it's at holomorphic. Okay, so this is important. Another way to, to define with the surface is actually comes from the classical classification of uh, algebraic surfaces, is to say that they are uh, this number is, means, means the irregularity, so it's zero. And the other part is relating to the canonical divisor. So we say that the canonical divisor is three. So K3 surfaces, examples of classical K3 surfaces, K3 surfaces are like coming from, for example, the first one is the baby Fermat. Okay, so consider the quartic in P3. Oh. Okay, and then sorry, if you consider this one in P3, you can prove that actually this is an Akechi surface. And if, in general, if you consider smooth quartics in P3, so consider another polynomial of degree four in P3, this is also a, an Akechi surface. Okay, so they are the big example. And how do you prove that 
it's uh, satisfied with these two conditions. So they assume that they have all of these uh, uh, main uh, settings. But now, what is, we want to prove it is that H10, for example, is three. Okay, and this is something that we can prove it by considering, for example, a hypersurfaces, right, e of degree D in Pn, then if you restrict the map of these, uh, of sections of these, uh, consider uh, the one to four, the one forms, this, uh, the sections in Pn, the restriction of this section is actually uh, induced a section for the device, uh, for the divisor on the, on the suit variety. So this is something coming actually for if you consider an arbitrary hypersurface in PN and the and the restriction of this mass induce an isomorphism. So there are no sections there in PN, but you compute the, the you compute the homology of PN and there are no sections in H10, so then there's no sections for particular for the hypersurface. So this is just for broadly speaking, how to prove it, that in general, and also apply it for this particular topic. And there is also a, the second condition that is to prove that the canonical divisor is trivial. So this is coming from the adjacent formula. Since even for the quartics, you can see, for example, that this one, a pupil can be seen like a section of okay and the point is that since the quartic can be seen like that the omega of the this q4 is taking the omega of p3 uh, tensor the omega uh, sorry, all four, and this is we know that is all minus three to minus one, and this is a uh, all four, so that give you in the system, and you restrict it to s to p four, and this give you that is three. Okay, so this is a way to think, but actually I wanted to present it just an sketch of this. Why is how to prove that this is an isolated surfaces? Because it's a natural way to think that which kind of hypersurfaces can give you these properties. So that these numbers vanish and that you don't have and that the trivial canonical, that you get the trivial canonical device. Okay? So then you can also play with this degree and try to prove intersection completed. So this is the first example. So the second one is something that comes more and more classical. And it's related to the Kummer surface. Question so for this part? No? Yeah, I can add one, sorry. Yes. Is there a difference between phi one and H10? I mean, are there surfaces which have uh, well, one thing is simply connected, and one thing is H1. Yeah, right. Yeah, but if you think this, if you you get the, the composition of H1, I mean if you consider H1 of the um, tensor with him. Yeah, yeah. You get this. Um, right? So this is a having a realization of the fundamental group. So this means in particular that if you have zero here, you get zero here, then you get zero here, and it's equivalent to second no. parts. No. No? No. <laughs> no. I mean, the, 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 the commodity to be torched, no? Yeah. And you have, you instance, have to prove that. Instance, when you have a, a weaker surface, you have to show that. Uh, uh, they are free torsion. Uh, I mean, that. That is. You know, yeah, whatever. You have to somehow see needed torsion here or something. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, certainly you have surfaces with. Uh, uh, H10 equal to zero, which are not simply connected. But you know, okay. maybe with, with this, if maybe K is trivial, then, uh, uh, no, then, then, then I mean, that, that K, K equal to O, I think, might imply there to be connected or something. I don't know. 
Okay. I mean, it might, it might, I don't know, it doesn't make sense because it can, uh, I think, yeah, anyway. but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's. Uh, okay. Uh, no, because for me, it's uh, it's a lot of nightmares. So he says, we should have a lot of nightmares. So he says, we You were considering where you were going that way, right? Okay. So you can take uh, the last service, we should have a thing of going to Bando, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, it's just the fundamental group is by one, is C2. No, I, 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 I don't. But you get many times. That I'm not sure. I mean, you have that. Case torch, case torch, case torch. Yeah, case. Yeah, case. Okay. I think it's I mean, also, uh, also in the in the classical classification of the surfaces with trigger symmetrical line bundle, you can there are ones that are not simply connected and are, for example, complex terms. Okay. So that's the next example that I want to say, and then the and how to relate it to a case surface. So this is the Comer, the Comer surface. And basically you start it by something that has this trivial canonical divisor, but without this condition. Okay, so how to get a KP surface is killing this, this part. So you start it by a complex torus. Okay, and there is always uh, here, and uh, the, the torus always comes with a natural involution, right? That is take the element here, and send them to minus L. So this is an involution, okay? And in the torus, it fits 16 points, okay? So there, are, there exists 16 points fixed by this involution. And this is, if you see, so there is a construction here. Like if you start by the by your complex torus, you consider the quotient, which is given by the natural quotient here. And this map, um, this map is the quotient, but here, these 16 points induce singularities in the quotient, okay? So these singularities are all of type A1, okay? And when you resolve these singularities, you consider the minimal resolution of this quotient, you will get an asorthesis that is a KP surface, okay? So let's say, this is the minimal resolution of these uh, 16 singularities of time. Okay, and this is the Kummer associated to X. Okay, so there is another way to complete this diagram because we like committed to diagrams. <laughs> And then the way that you can complete and actually include if you the way to prove that this number is zero is to do it in a smooth way. So here I have these 16 points. I can do blow up of these 16 points. And let's call this blow up depth. Okay. So this involution here can be extended in an involution here in a natural way because just following the, the description of the blow up. But now when you consider the portion of these surfaces with this new involution, that this is a, this give you a map to the humor of the surface. It's not a trivial exercise. But the point is that you can complete it and this, uh, this diagram is committed. So you can also obtain the humor like the portion of this blow up in 16 points of this complex torus and uh, by the natural involution extension. Okay? So why I introduce this also this example because it's natural to think, I will mention in the higher uh, dimensional uh, analogous of K3 surfaces, how can we get it also hyperthermal of this, but in higher dimension. So the point here is that also you can think about, and this is um, um, people work on, the, on this problem, that also it's possible to do these constructions, but for other orders, uh, for other automorphisms, the difference orders. And yes, the question is yes, you can do it, but you can ask that this map exists in the in the case of the torus and is compatible with some map coming from the KP surface. And this is that will be the second ingredient that I will stop in the in the second talk. That is simplex. So 
And in order three, for example, um, you can study the, the, the family of Petri surfaces coming like a resolution of a complex torus by an automorphism of order three in the in the torus. Okay. But this automorphism is not free like the evolution, because the evolution comes always with the complex torus. But for order three, it's not always true. So you have to put you have to also to study the moduli. Okay, so this is the second one. And the third one that I want to say is the double tolerance of P2. So ramify in some particular divisors. So this divisor will be a smooth 60. Okay. So this is Anna curve of degree six and it. Okay. And if you consider the double covering in this uh, branch locus of this uh, this is your your card that you will get one one, this map, the 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 surface here is an acade surface. Okay, and this is Another interesting example for for these uh, for these surfaces. You can also prove it that uh, by the properties of this uh, finite uh, degree of maps that the canonical divisor is trivial. Okay, and it's basically using the fact that the degree is six. Okay, so this is the way how we prove it that it's also a case So I think that that was the examples that I want to mention. And um, now I've lost my telephone. Okay. So now what I want to do is try to generalize these uh, examples for higher dimension. Okay. So let me see. Okay. So the first example that yeah, if I wanted to think how to generalize these facts for uh, and obtain something in dimension for at least at least four, you can think it that, uh, for example, yeah, let's take this one. <laughs> I uh, one of my favorite. Uh, if you consider, so we are thinking now. Okay, let's just define it first. The the, the so what is an a hyperkeller? And now it's basically the same things that I impose this condition in this general setting. And actually, the argument that I presented as a decomposition in the first degree of the homology, uh, you can actually ask this number is equal to zero. But when you uh, generalize the definition on hyperkeller manifold, actually, what you really ask is that the fundamental group is trivial. Okay? So, this is the same definition for hyperkeller manifolds. Okay, and the fact that the canonical divisor is trivial actually is also in the in, in the in the general setting is replaced by this by this property. So, in other words, hyperkeller manifolds in the in in dimension two correspond to KP surfaces in the different equivalence definitions that you have or are meeting for a KP surface. So these ones, so when when you want them to do that, so the first example that you have in mind is try to do something like this kind of a uh, game, but now consider product of KP surfaces. So let's for example so let S be a K3 surface. Okay. And now I will consider the product of this K3 surface. Okay. For instance. And then I will also get the quotient here by an involution. Okay. And this. 
when I result, when I get the involution here, so you get the permutations, right? So what are the fixed locus here? The fixed locus is the diagonal. Diagonal, sorry. So this is a, a set where it's not defined, so it's not well defined. And then you consider the blow up in the product of this set of points, and then you get a new variety. So so they blow up or and, and okay and of course you get the minimal resolution of this also and then what actually you get it here is an uh, variety of dimension four okay which correspond to what the professor Lothar introduced, like the Hilbert scheme um, on two points of S. Okay? So it's not trivial, it's not immediately that this uh, variety is the, and a hyperkeller manifold of dimension four. This actually was proven by Bobin. Okay? And then you can also do the same game. But consider now any product of this S, okay? And then also you consider the action of this uh, symmetric group, and then you study again the set of points where it's not uh, where it's fixed by this map. You resolve it, and then you get a similar uh, construction, but now in n code. So the Hilbert scheme of n points on a K3 surface. So instead two, two, you put n times. Okay. There is an, of course, there is a, a more a nice description of this a variety in terms of soft schemes, as uh, Professor Lothar is saying in the in in his talk, and also those correspondence are the same. Like uh, this is a Geometrical model in some sense, and then, and yeah, this is a this is an example. So what happened here? If you do, for example, instead to take a three surface, you consider an abelian surface. Okay, so that means that your torus is projected also, and if you do the same construction here, you can define the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of the torus. And what you actually get is an a hyperkeller manifold, also another type of hyperkeller manifold. So this one actually, if you do the construction, if you consider hill and of some abelian surface, this give you is another example. Yeah. Of hyperkeller. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not simply connected or whatever. So you you take the the sub thing of that is the the the, the high order Puma construction is the sort of inverse image of something. Mm -hmm. You I mean, this is not the hyperkähler manifold. It is. It's a is an a complex term. It's a, an abelian variety. Yeah. It's not the Puma type. The generalized Puma no. type. So, so, then, so you have the map from uh, ah, from me to the end. So you, you you sum them up and take the inverse image of zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But the point, yeah, yeah. You're right. So this is something that generalized means the generalized of this uh, in the in the case when n is equal to one, you get the Kummer exactly the Kummer, uh, the Kummer. The Kummer surface, which is an Akatri surface. And then if you consider for any greater than one, then you consider you have to, to do something shift there. So, for, so the Kummer surface is you take the Hilbert scheme of two points mm -hmm. and you you take the you have the map from the Hilbert scheme of two points, which adds in the group the two okay. the two up adds up the two points, take the inverse image of zero under this map, that's the Kummer variety. Okay. The, the Hilbert scheme of two points has dimension. The Hilbert scheme of one point is not hyperkähler. The Hilbert scheme of two points is um, uh, 
I mean, the Hilbert scheme of one point is just A. The Hilbert scheme of two points would be something else. And, but you take the inner limit of zero under this map. I mean, uh, so it's not precisely that, but the Kuma construction is precisely, you know, taking the Hilbert scheme by taking the inverse image of zero under the map of summing up the, the points on the surface. Okay. You know, in the, using the group structure. Okay, okay. So it's a. Okay. And so the, it, that's a different way of describing the Kumar construction. If you just mm -hmm. see what 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 you have written down, what that does, you know, this just precisely means that you you kind of take just two copies, you take the inverse image of zero after and ending up. Anyway, okay. it doesn't matter. I mean, just, okay. So, you know. <laughs> I think it's like okay. I'm 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 more in the in the type of case, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking that okay. I was reading also preparing the, the seminar that for n equal to one, that actually justify the name of the generalized Kummer type because yeah. n equal to one in the in that description is just correspond to Kummer surface and is something that comes from a complex torus and then give you a k surface. So then if you do for any large than one, then you get in higher dimension other example to hyperkeller manifolds. Okay, so that but yeah. yeah. The general life. Okay. So there are other two uh, particular examples that I just want to mention like uh for they exist in dimension six and ten and are so the, I mean, at least how they appear in the in the in this, this story is relating to something that I want to introduce in the last part of the first talk that is relating to modulized space of shifts, okay, on the surfaces or in Avenue. And the point is that when you start to study these modulized spaces, in some cases, if you put the good hypothesis on the on the shoes of the topological invariance, you can get Again, the, the structure of the KP surfaces, or uh, in but in higher dimension, and 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 the point is that they are provide another kind of uh, examples of hypercalculus. But the point is that if study these modulized spaces, you can find two exceptional uh, cases in dimension six and dimension ten, and their examples were introduced by O'Grady. Uh, so, and it's denoted by O'Grady 6 and O'Grady <laughs> So the point uh, I will mention just, I will, see, I, will, I will do some comments about uh, how they comes in the, in the construction of the moduli spaces. Uh, okay, so what happened uh, for the, the big question in this uh, topic is, Try to find new examples of hyperkeller manifolds different to the ones that I described here. So this is something that I mean, for instance, you need to impose some in some condition, some setting to say that the, those that I presented here are the noun. And basically it's coming from the notion of what is deformation. Okay. So deformation type we would say that, for example. I don't want to say many things of the, uh, so what is deformation, but it's in the classical Kuranishi deformation setting. But uh, if you know what is that, good. If not, just assume it like a, a definition. So you, we say that X is a hyperkeller of K3 any type if X is deformation equivalent to a Hilbert scheme of n points on a case of space. And also, if you put that um, in this setting of the deformation, you can also say like a is the type of a general generalized Kummer if you can deform it as a a Kummer a, a generalized Kummer uh, variety. So and also OG six and OG ten. So but what are why they are very different? Because this deformation you can also read it in terms of the Hodge structures, and that's the point 
of the of the second part of this first part. <laughs> so introduce what is a Toretti theorems and then the, and also the role of the second group of cohomology. So this is an advanced model, okay? But more more than a Z model, it's a lattice. So the, the point that is that this uh, group of commodity is a lattice is that he comes with it comes with an a bilinear form, which is non-degenerate, it is given by the cap product. Okay. So we can study this um group of commodity, and actually, if we consider Okay, now a T surface or and a hydrocellar. Uh, okay. Hydrocellar. Right? Uh, but then the cap product is not the correct form. It's the ruby bubble model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, in the case of the cap surfaces, it's the cap product. And then when you get here, the this um, when you consider the complex structure of this atom model, you know that this comes from another uh, complex structure given by the fact that is scalar. And actually, you know that this is, can can be decomposed by these pieces. Okay. So what is important here is that when you consider, so just for notation, this is something, this is H zero of X on omega forms, okay? Okay, and the same for the other, but two zeros, okay? So the point here is that we know this is the part that contains the the holomorphic two forms, right? So this is actually generated by this omega x. Okay, this is the part that contains the geometry of the of the hypercellular manifold. It basically is encoded if you consider the set uh, the as a zeta model, you consider this uh, intersecting to h two x of zeta. This is actually the peak of x, which is isomorphic to the non-severity of x, when x is an a hybrid element. So here we know that, I mean, the, the role of this part in the next part of the talk is that contain information of the many divisors here, okay? And the cons give you how to precise the, the complex structure of this uh, hybrid element or the hybrid element that we are studying. So this is something that uh, so this is the mobile bottom model form that actually as a lattice, if you think this uh, homological group is almost it's it's unique at two isometries. And the point is that if you study lattices in an abstract way, for these families that I mentioned, you can get precise formulas of how it decomposes as a lattice. So for instance, if you have the Hilbert scheme on a K3 surface, you will get that this one is isomorphic to three copies of E, U, sorry, two copies of this negative defined Lattice E8 plus at a part coming from the exceptional divisor. If you consider Kummer type, it's just, uh, I think, Euclid plus. And the other ones I have to bring in. Just 
is the oh wait. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, how you can distinguish that those examples were different? Because when you computed this set converting number, now I present them here, I'm a little bit shaken because now you can count <laughs> what is the right here. And these uh, numbers are different, right? But the point is that uh, when you, if you are constructing a new example, and if you find that these numbers are equal, then we be correspond. It's, it's possible that they correspond to the same type of deformation. Okay, so the, these ones are different. Like for instance, OG six have dimension six. So you can think that, for example, if you consider n equal to three and n equal to three, if you compute the second converting number of this one, is different to the Hilbert scheme on train points of a case surfaces or the available surface, right? So this is how already in some sense uh, found new examples of hybrid elements. And all again, and, and the same for OG10. So, okay. I have a couple of minutes. So I wanted to say something about the Torelli theorem. So the Torelli theorem, is a, Powerful theorem that in K3 surfaces say uh, when two K3 surfaces are isomorphic or not in a nice way. So, for instance, let's say that X and Y here are K3 surfaces. And the other theorem says, broadly speaking, is that if there exists an isometry. Of lattices of H2X and H2Y, which is a Hodge isometry, then X is isomorphic to Y. Okay? So it's enough to consider. So it's powerful the fact that this uh, cap product actually determines the complex structure of the both KT surfaces. And this is something that you can want in also for higher dimension. But the point is that in higher dimension, it's not immediately that if you construct a hot isometry of these two lattices, then you can get it that the both hyperkeller manifolds are isomorphic. And this is the like the difference on the on the hyperkeller approach. So that part there, there are so many versions of this thoroughly theorems, and actually, I mean, firstly, it was uh, proved by Berbitsky in a, in a more in a differential geometrical setting, and then the Hoybrick then is stated more in terms of lattices, but uh, it was a weak version, and then Markman uh, basically formulate these questions in terms of monotony operators. And that also monotony operators and deformations are are very very in some in close the idea of how to distinguish these families. But I don't want to present in the monotony operators because I need even more time to introduce why it's that and that and, and what I need. But the point here is that for any theory for hypercellers. can be uh, summarized in say that but we need to study uh, the codes. So there are 
there's the alpha cone, there is the net cone, and there is the movable cone for a hyperterrain uh, variety. We assuming that it's projected to, to get some stuff from the size. And uh, but it's also true for, for, for non projectives, so just more delicate. So the point here is that the theoretic theorem you can also statement in some sense like this, but asking more conditions on this hot isometry. And the point is that, um, so let's say that uh, if there exists, let's call it this area, hot isometry. So under this, these conditions, if P is satisfied, satisfied that the movable cone, the full back, no, sorry, this one, uh, the movable cone. So let's say that this is also coming from, so there exists here a map, which is the isomorphy, such that the full back correspond to this map, to the isomorphies between the, the two k results. Now I want to say the same for hyperkeller manifolds, but I will impose some conditions of this map. So I need that P sends the movable cone. I put it in the right way? No, I'm sorry. Okay, the map in homology is actually um, the mapping homology corresponds to the pullback in this isomorphism. Okay. So if I put this notation, I will ask that the mapping homology, uh, the, the pullback in homology, sends the movable cone of Y in the movable cone of X. And at this level, if you ask that your isometry satisfies your hot isometry satisfy this condition that send the movable cone of y in the small cone of x, you get that x and y are irrational. Okay, so that's the point. So in K3 surfaces, there is no notion of birational K3 surfaces because all of these are uh, minimal, right? So here, when you are in the in higher dimension, you can get different models by rational models of a hyperkeller model. And that's the point here that you just on this level, you can just distinguish when to a uh, hyperkeller are birational or not. But how can I extend this uh, birational morphism to the properly isomorphism? Asking the second condition. So if a start of the net or not. So we need to ask now of X intersect the ample cone like then uh, this V is an isomorphism. Okay, so this is the how the cons uh, encode the, the 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 geometry of the of the hyperkeller in two levels, by rational and isomorphism. Okay, and I think that this is also under the setting that I'm projecting, so they are projectives. For a general statement, you need to impose, you need to introduce the, the notion of monodromy groups and, and parallel transport. So I want to skip that version, but just to keep an idea, this, uh, what is the theory theorem for this in this setting? And because I will use it also in the, in the second part. So what happened in the, uh, so we can say about the net con and the movable con for the K3 surfaces. So this is, so this one actually, the ample cone is the in, 
interior of this net cone. So in case these surfaces, this is an equivalent, uh, this is an uh, equality, okay? So that's why for K3 surfaces, these two cases are the same, okay? So it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a reason. So I think that I have just one minute for the first part. So maybe I can just in the second part introduce what is the moduli space and how we would use it to uh, study why we study moduli space uh, of stable chips in order to get other examples of hyperteller methods. So yeah, so next sample would be study moduli space of stable chips on K3 surfaces. And we will see that when we fix some topological invariants, we get it that actually these moduli spaces are examples of hyperkeller but in higher dimensions. So they come, they still have the, the geometry of the K3 surface that you are studying, but now they are parameterized in other uh, objects. So these objects actually are the stable chips. So then we stop here. And do you have some questions? So maybe for a comments for other examples of hyperkeller, uh, there are so many examples in so many papers. Uh, for these examples, but in another presentation, like uh, you consider that there exists a Lagrangian vibration, then you could on some other conditions that you can get that that one is the formation equivalence of this one. Okay, for example, of the seeds or all the and uh, and yeah, they are also in just in this type of deformation that is K three N five. We have this cohomology here, which is very, very useful in order to study a uh, one uh, a hyperkeller that lives in this family can be say like a Hilbert skin of n points. This is properly a Hilbert skin of n points, or is just birational to the Hilbert skin of nothing or totally different. So we will study in the next part the ones that are in this deformation type. When you say partial isometry, you mean uh, morphism of partial structure? That's yeah. An isometry of the lattice. Yeah, yeah. It's an amorphism in terms of the lattices that respect the the whole the structure of both. So you send the pieces in the right way. The the, the form how how does it act on let's say the H two zero? Does it map things from H two zero to H two like two things of H two zero? Good. Send into the exactly to the what other. What about one. something in H two zero and something in H one one? Where is it? Where does it go to? No, 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 it's not possible. You have to send the two zero part here in the two zero part here. No, the no, one, one. I mean, uh, on one cohomology. Um, what does the form do? In H one form in H one. No, no. So the question is, the the cohomology quadratic form. Mm -hmm. How does it, you know, in the pairing with respect to the different Hodge types? So you know, if you have something of type P, uh, two zero multiplied with something of type two zero, what will it be zero or will it be something else? I think uh, uh -huh. yeah, that was the question. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, okay. And you think? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't understand very well the question, sorry. But it's not part of the, it's not part of the definition of what it is. No. Uh, yeah. but, I mean, we can discuss also. Okay, another question. What I mean, can I ask us what is the status of the art? I guess there are also many non existence here. I hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was there for a very in 1994. I heard something <laughs> that's proved. But 
that the, the, I mean, yeah, there are so many bounds. I mean, many. There are some bounds of the of the Hodge numbers for of the possible hyperkeller manifold. Yes. Presumably, there are only left or very few. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. This is an strategy. Like uh, you, you start to to think in something like that that you compute these numbers and then you see that if it's less than this bound, and then you are maybe. Uh, half and a good candidate. Perfect dimension eight. Uh, how many hopes do we have to have another? That's a good question, but uh, yeah, yeah, good uh, question, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that if you also precise the dimension, you can get more restriction. Yeah, yeah. Nice question. Okay, so let's do the pause. Pause? Okay. okay. I would love to leave. <laughs> okay, so, so the second part of the talk is relating to the problem that I was a study in, the, in my PhD, which is uh, relating to uh, studying subjective actions. Okay. Synthetic actions also actually in case result pieces and then to a particular type of deformation that I, I was focused in the, the k genotype. And then the, I would just give a motivation of this type of uh, actions that just in the case of k surfaces, they come from automorphisms. And they are very, very interesting because it's another way to construct so many examples of k surfaces giving up a uh, minimal resolution of quotients of K3 surfaces by symplectic automorphisms. And basically, the theory says that under a symplectic action, you will get again a K3 surface, a new family, and uh, it is not symplectic, which is uh, that, uh, that not satisfied the our condition, then it produces another example, another family, which is relating to rational surfaces, for instance. That happens in the case of K3 surfaces, but when you study symplectic actions on hyperkeles on higher dimension, you will also get that this condition that being, being symplectic can also obtain in for birational maps. And the action will be a study in the in, in cohomology induced by this new symplectic birational maps. So mean symplectic here is that uh, the map preserves the period, so preserves the two holomorphic forms. So let's say that F G it's a it's a map here. Okay, it's for instance a birational map, such so that when you consider the action in cohomology and you compute what is the image of the period, sometimes it's called a period of these uh, hybrid element it's the identity, okay? This kind of uh, actions can be changed. In general, it's uh, some power of uh, M group, but when it's symplectic, it's probably one, okay? When it's non-symplectic, you get something different to one here, okay? And there are people and so many people that study these kind of actions. So, um, but I want to finish the, the, the previous talk with an interesting example, which is coming from a study moduli space of shifts, in particular stable shifts. On K3 surfaces. And that was the end of the abstract in the in the first talk. So how to how to get a, a good modular space and how to impose the geometry of a hyperkeller manifold for this modular space? This coming from a, from the fact that I imposed this this hypothesis. Okay, so conditions for instance. So a stable here. So a stable is according to the, the stability condition in terms of the Hilbert polynomial. 
sheep here in uh, it's a uh, free function sheep and then you want that satisfied the condition it's, it's the stable with respect to you consider a sheep here and then you consider a sub shifts here and the, the stability conditions means that for this street con, con uh, yes sub shifts the Hilbert polynomial which is something that depends on the polarized of the K3 surface is less than the less. You would say sometimes that semi-stable you will put here uh, less or equal. So for semi-stable, this is the case of semi-stable. And there is other this is in terms of the Hilbert polynomial, but there is a factor in this Hilbert polynomial that is the slope. And actually, you can ask conditions like it's just slope stable, and there is good properties like a, for instance, for a shift, new stable, which is not stable, just a piece of this Hilbert polynomial implies stable implies semi-stable implies new semi-stable. So when you want to study this kind of uh, spaces, you're parameterizing on a K3 surface. So uh, let's say that F is a K3 surface, a polarized K3 surface. Where H is the polarization of the embedding in, in a projected space. Let's say that H is ample. Okay. This condition is something that depends on the polarization. So the, this graph that you choose in your in your K results. And then um, if you want to parameterize these objects, stable shifts, you need to see that these actually correspond. At least on a skin, a quasi projected of schemes, and may, if you put more restrictions on the variance of this shift, you will get that actually it's a hyper -polymer. So, how to do that? So, that for instance, just keep in mind that this condition implies this one is always true for these this, uh, precaution shifts, but to get the another uh, implication is something that we can do it using. Are imposing some topological invariance. Okay. <clears throat> and, and this is what I want to introduce. So if not just parameterized these stable sheets, if, if you consider a K3 surface with a polarization, you can see a particular lattice, which is called the Mukai lattice. Of associated to S, that is the sum of A0 of S integrals coefficients plus H2 of S plus H2. Okay, and this is like a, a vector here, we, we call it a Mukai vector. It lives here with some condition, with some properties that I just want to skip it for a moment. But we will say that in the second component, the second component lives in the neural severity. If you remember the neural severity or the picker group that were isomorph isomorphic, uh, A is it's considered H11 intersecting to these uh, two lattice. Okay? This MUKAI vector, so let's say that is. Uh, D1, D2, and D3. Okay. And this is since this lattice comes with a bilinear form. And the bilinear form is that if you have two elements, the product is given by minus D1. Yes. Plus 
minus okay so this times this this times this this times like with an alternative sum the point is that this is the bilinear form in the neuron severity so in the middle of the structure here okay and the and this is something that is an integral, okay? And this is also an integral because the linear form arrives to the to the integers numbers. So, so if you consider there is a natural uh, morphism that is called the mukai um, morphism, and if you consider a chip, you will send them this chip to the rank of the chips. And uh, C1 of the shifts and P of this one minus one of this. Okay, so this is the, the older characteristic. So, <clears throat> this is a map, okay, defined by Mukai in the beginnings. And then, and the point is that now I want to parameterize stable sheet objects on my K3 surfaces that under this map they have this number fixes. So I will fix a vector B. So I call it B here, fix B. And then this moduli space that I will denote it like this is just the moduli. Space. So H is stable chips on this K3 surface with Mukai vector B. So this model space is parameterized. This stable chips with respect to this polarization. But now, under this map, all of these invariants are fixed by this B fixed in the middle. Okay? So, <clears throat> this actually is a nice modular space. This is not a trivial exercise. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's also, uh, if you consider, so, so that is not compact, so you can also compactify. Okay, this is something that it oops. It, it this is an open set in this compactification, and the compactification can be written like adding a, a, a chips that are semi-stable. Okay, it's properly. I mean, it's it's very right, it's technical, but the uh, the point is that you add more chips that now are semi-stable. And this give you the compactification of this modular space, and now it's common. So this compactification. <laughs> okay. So now, if I want, so at this level, we have something that is a good modular space, a good candidate, but I don't have that they they, they are hyperkähler manifolds. So how to get that they are hyperkähler manifolds? So imposing some conditions on this topological invariant. So this is the first shell class. This is something in terms of the first and the second shell class, the Euler characteristic. And then I will fix this invariance and impose some conditions on the square of this element with this bilinear form, such that uh, provide examples of, of k type. So this is the result for many people. So first, Mukai. Which you have problems with my <laughs> surname now. I have problems with your surname. Uh, Horvitz and O'Grady. And finally, you show them. Okay, so how do I, I, I write in a nice way? No, it's like that. Two T's, but I mean, uh, so, so this is uh, 
So what they say that if you consider, for example, you have to impose a condition of the of the of the ample bundle. So H is a uh, B generic. So this is a condition that basically says that it's not living in is not a wall in the cone of your K3 surface. So you can also ask that B is primitive. So it means that you cannot factorize for some other uh, vector, okay, uh, yeah, other Mukai vector. So it is not possible like to take KW for K and integral. Okay. So you are also asked that the square is greater or equal to minus two in order to, to get that it's not empty, this moduli space. And I think that's enough to say that this moduli space is a hyperheader manifold of K3 any type. Okay, and actually the dimension here, the two n is the dimension, and uh, n can be obtained. Okay, so this interesting example is relating to the second part because when I impose the condition of let's consider an a hyperteller of KTN type admitting this symplectic action coming from a birational map, then actually it's enough to say that it, it, this symplectic action is not trivial. Okay, that say that the the hyperteller manifold has to be a moduli space that as I described in, in, in that way. Okay, so that's the, the first result on this on this paper. So so the first statement so third one. And so it is it's a hyperheter of K and a type admitting um reflecting by rational map non trivial. Then X is isomorphic with a mobilized space on a K to surface S with this with a polarization. Okay. So we will see that uh, as a consequence of this theorem, uh, this particular uh, Hyperkeller manifold cannot be general of the or cannot be general. So that means that the, the Picard number cannot be one. So actually have to be at least two. But in the particular case, case then the Picard number of this is, is two, then the order of, of this symplectic by rational map. Is equal to two. So it's just admitting involutions. Okay. And the and the third result that we get it, it was more relating to another question. So it was more relating to try to find or uh, or how, how to prove the existence of these symplectic birational maps for the the good candidates okay so the point is of, of the third result is now thinking that under this hypothesis we get it that it's a moduli space so how can you impose conditions on this moduli space in order to obtain symplectic birational maps okay so maps that respect uh, the period and uh, 
And oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say an important hypothesis is that uh, it's a simplected by rational map such that the action in cohomology, when you um, consider the action in the quotient, it's not trivial, where A X is by definition the discriminant group of the of the of these labs. Okay. Why well, this condition? Because I want to do something that is property by rational. I mean, it can be also an outcome of this. And the outcome of this satisfies that when you're restricted to this discriminant group, the action is trivial. Okay. So I impose that is there is something that you cannot understand. Okay. Okay. So um, and the theorem three, I have to write. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like a I receive. Uh, let S be a K to surface. It's B. Like that. Uh, this is a primitive vector. Consider also that R is different to zero. And if you fix T e equal to R C C square S fix this one, the reflection on this class. Is induced by a vibrational involution with non trivial action on A. Mm. So now we can see that. If and only if some conditions are satisfied. So, why well, we put it here? Because, uh, yeah, I will say some comments later. So the conditions are that what are E? Why sorry? I'm not lost in the What are E? R E is an R reflection. Sorry. It's a, it's a particular map. I will introduce ah, okay. yes. Um so if and only if B satisfied. The following condition so r divided to c uh, maximum and uh, the greater common divisor of r and s is equal to one or two and um, also different to one and two Okay, B is not one. Okay, B has to be different to this one. Uh, I will explain it just in a moment. Um, it's that.
And if I have time, I will give some examples. <laughs> Just to, to say that these conditions are useful. <laughs> so what is the meaning of this theorem? So we are trying to find a nice criteria to, to, to prove the existence of this type uh, of symplectic rational maps on modularized spaces. For a theory, uh, since Theorem two say that if you look the rank that is equal to two, you don't have to uh, wait that the order be greater than than two. So you have just involutions. So what are the good candidates for involutions? Reflections maps. But reflections are maps in the homology with coefficients in Q. So rational coefficients. So it's not always a map in Z. Okay. So how do you get that your map? with coefficients in Q can be uh, actually a map with coefficients in Z. The point is asking some of these uh, conditions, but it's something that comes from the from, from results of Marman studying these monodromy operators on reflections uh, for some particular class in commodity. So this is the mysterious <laughs> of these uh, conditions. And this, and so in particular, this one, and the other part is like a, if you are that your MUKAI uh, vector is different to all of these options, then you will get a good candidate and a hyperkeller of KPNSI, which is a mobilized space, and uh, with an involution uh, given by the reflection. Okay, so that's more or less the idea to prove the existence to say good candidates that are uh, these involutions, okay? And and the point to how to prove these results, so, okay, this is more a corollary, <laughs> but this, fine, why? Because you, you need to also study the cons for this particular case, but let's say a couple of words of this theorem, one and theorem two. So the first part is something that comes from the classical facts to study these symplectic actions. These symplectic actions you study in commodity, okay? And if you impose the conditions of this, that is this action in the discriminant group is non-trivial because there are two options or is trivial or not for, for tradition for classical results, then you can get it that um, this uh, hyperteller is birational to a modelized space, okay? But the fact that how can I study all birational models of this uh, modelized space is using a second technique relating to the technique of the theorem three and is the bridge line stability conditions. So then here, the model, I, I'm arrived to the, we are right, sorry, to a birational model of X uh, first. So first we get it a birational model and then we can say that it's isomorphic to the modular space using some facts, so strong facts on the stability uh, conditions uh, theory. Okay, so that gives you the isomorphism. So why they are interesting? For, so why people study symplectic variational maps? For instance, if you think in the OG10. Okay, so I have to say, OG10, that was this uh, exceptional example in dimension 10. Uh, OG10 can be constructed by uh, a modular space of shifts, right? But with a not primitive Mokai vector. Okay, so then if you parameterize these stable shifts, I think it's on a Kirchhoff surface or on a, yeah, OG10 yeah. on, on a Kirchhoff surface. The other case of this is on a Hilbert. And you try to parameterize this family, but you don't have immediately a statement like uh, the big one with the so many people. Uh, you actually, what you get it is a singular mobilized space. And when, when you resolve the singularities, 
that that produce the new example. Okay, so that, for example, this modular space uh, just admit birational symplectic knots. So there are not automorphisms uh, that are symplectic in OG thing. So this is actually a recently resolved by people like Juventana, uh, uh, Grassi, um, Honorati, uh, uh, Cesar. So they were studied this particular example. The Alisa uh, Grassi, uh, she was also studied for the case of OG6, and then you get something similar for synthetic action. So at least for the known examples, uh, it's quite mysteriously for the big family of k 3 n type. But in the case of the automorphism, it was something very deep studied by Giovanni Mongardi and Hassan and, and, and collaborators, where they studied precise uh, actions of uh, these symplectic automorphisms. In the case of birational maps, this is the statement that generalized and finished this classification. So that's uh, the point. And Kummer, I don't know. <laughs> So um, I think that the, there are partial results in that on, on the finger part. Um, yes. So, so what? Um, how many minutes I have? Ten minutes. <laughs> so let's say a, a, a little bit of the for for the theory of well, right? So so how to study this uh, this problem? So as I say, the first step is. Study the action in homology of these maps. Okay, so what is the upstart in H two XZ for a birational uh, map, symplectic birational map? But this is something that you can do it in some big classes with half. A good property, and if uh, you can embed it in an abstract lattice that is isomorphic to the Mukai lattice on a case So, what is the point? I would like to get a modular space, but I don't have an event a Mukai base. So I need to find a candidate, a good candidate, and ask many questions. <laughs> so it is corresponding to the, the Mukai vector that I was looking for. So this is something, I mean, this is this idea comes from Markman theory. And and, and the point is using this embedding. So the the previous theory, the big theorem that I wrote here comes with an extra. Uh, an extra tool, which is an isometry. And the isometry, the isometry is called the Mukai isometry because relate this Mukai vector to the commodity of my hyperkeller of k type. So when you get x a modular space, this is the good uh, yes. So in fact, let us that the square here is um, greater than zero. So I put the condition that is greater than minus two. Okay. When it's minus two, you get that the modular space is just a point. If the square, if it's an isotropic element, so the square is zero, you will get again an arcade three surfaces, probably not isomorphic to the first one, which is possible. And, um, and if this greater than than zero, then you will get four folds, six folds, whatever you want. And um, just that in the case when it's zero, then you this map is actually divided by zero. Okay, that's for instance, I will ask this. And this is a particular, this this is explicit. Okay, this is explicit, it, it, it also comes from in terms of uh, the like categories, I don't want to introduce it here because we don't need it. Just I need that there exists this the inverse, okay? And let's denote it by theta, okay? The inverse map. So this theta make me uh, 
see the commodity of this one in this particular lattice. Okay? Just for instance, I will denote it by lambda Q. And then and it comes to basically see uh, completely this part with a mochi vector, my possible mochi vector. So you can find a V in this abstract lattice such that uh, H2X zeta. Uh, Okay, so this is very abstract, and this is the stuff that is very powerful for the theory of lattice, because this, when you compute some properties of this mochi lattice, you get unimodularity. Okay, and unimodularity is very nice in order to get primitive embeddings and don't put some torsions and anyway. So now I would like to extend this action in this bigger lattice and basically i need just to see what happened in this new vector so this is a claim but it's part it's it's a, it's a proposition so under the hypothesis that the action in this quotient is non-trivial the extension of g on b and i still denote it by the fallback of g is equal to minus b. So there are not many options. It sends b in minus b. Okay? So this is an extension. So the, the first this step basically extends g in in my class b. Okay. And since the I can see this homology like uh I mean uh, sorry I can see this lambda tilde as this homology plus this new vector b then in the part of the homology is the same no? is the, the ones that i fix it so this new action using tools on lattice theory you can prove that the co-invariant lattice which is taking the the invariant lattice, the orthogonal complement to the invariant lattice with respect to the mochi abstract lattice, okay, has signature one something else, which is the grand. This is the this is the this lattice is just consider the action in H2, okay? And doing the same. So I consider the action in the cohomology, I consider the invariant classes, and then I consider the orthogonal complement to the invariant, okay? It's called the co-invariant Okay, but the point is that the negative part of the lattice is something that comes just for the action on the cohomology group. And this new class, this positive class, is actually this B. Okay? So this one is for the for the B. And then this one is just the rank of the coinvariant lattice on my cohomology. Okay? So why this is useful? Because now the theory say how to classify um, in some sense these lattices. And actually that was the idea for the classification on Hasson and collaborators. <laughs> and then they get like a 279, I think so, possible uh, coinvariant lattices, and that's come from a particular atomics. But they did it for the atomics, so uh, here it's more general, so it's just for my rationale. And the point is that you pass from this new um, embedding, and then you want to classify it as well. And also, the step two is how to identify at, at the level 
of uh, lattice theory, you can impose conditions uh, in this abstract lattice. So again, so this is lambda, this is a mukai lattice, which is abstract because essentially you can split for pieces like three copies of U, two copies of E8, and actually four copies of U and two copies of E8. That comes from the commodity of your KT surfaces plus the terms of H0 and H4. This gives you another U. So this is this is isomorphic, always at this to this lattice, which is unimodular, you can see. And then you can, as a lattice, induce an Ahochi structure. And then you consider the one one part of this Hochi structure. And if you find some copies of U, if, if you find copies of U, a one copy of U embedding in this primitive uh, lattice, this is equivalent to say that your hyperkeller manifold under this embedding is actually birational to a modular space of shifts on a K3 surface for some K3 surface. Okay? So, actually, our theorem says it's something more with details. We actually found it copies of you, a twisted copies of you. And the point is that instead to have a modular stable, a modular space of the stable shifts on a K3 surfaces, you get modular space of the stable shift on a twisted K3 surface. With twisted, it's just a notion in the in the chips. Okay, but the but the condition is the same stability as the Hilbert polynomial. Okay, just to be careful. And this is a this is a fact that actually in the non-twisted case was something proved by Addington. And in the twisted case, it was generalized by Collins. Okay? So we used this fact, we used this new embedding, and we actually compute that, for instance, this is something that you have to believe it, but the co-invariant part of a symplectic action always live in this uh, one one part. On the hot structure of this localize. So it's enough to prove that this twisted choppies of U can be also finite in the coin variant lattice. And the point here is that uh, you impose, you start to uh, see what happened to this number here. You can you can find that actually this is greater or equal than four. And this is enough to to get uh, this this possible embeddings of the hyperbolic plane. So this is a couple of ideas of the proof, but it's more technical than. That. Any questions? And I don't know if I start if I, if I have time. Just two minutes. <laughs> no, just um. Just to say something about the other results and, and why they come in some natural way. So then you are adhered to the birational model. And then there is this theorem that uh, of Bayer and Macri that say at the level of the stability conditions. So your modular space now can be seen as a modular space dependent now for a new parameter, which is an stability conditions. And the way that you study these birational models of this modular space can be uh, uh, um, can be replaced or can be translated in a decomposition of the of this stability manifold. The point is that when you arrive to the birational model, you can find another modular space which is isomorphic to the to the first one. So at the end, what do you get is that this hyperkeller of k 3 type is birational to a sub modular space. Which is isomorphic to another birational modular space on a K3 surfaces, but now depending on an stability condition. So then when you are right here, you will do the good computations in the good chamber, and then you forget about 
these stability conditions, you arrive to this classical one, the Gieseker moduli space. And then it's very natural to think here what happened for this for these conditions. So the statement, so the idea is Bayer and McCain post a map which relate the decomposition, the wall crossing on the stab manifold and the decomposition in chambers and wall of the cone of your moduli space. So the cones again playing a good role. And now these reflection maps are coming from the decomposition in my stability manifold, which correspond to the vertical wall. So there is a component in there that is very special because it's vertical. The other one can be semicircle to other okay. This one, the vertical, you get it by this map, and that gives you a class in the cone. Okay. This class, this class have the play of E. Okay. And on the sun assumptions of this E, as I mentioned before, this map is something in commodity of Q, but on the sun assumptions, you will get that this is actually uh, an ISO, um, a map in, in the commodity with integral scope issues. So that gives you one part, and the point that it's in place is the non trivial action on, on the discriminant group comes from imposing these uh, numerical conditions. So that gives you many restrictions of your multi vector. So why this is interesting? I mean, because applying, I mean, at this level, you lost a lot of information of the geometry of S. Even this stuff comes from Torelli theorems and existence and this, but this is, they don't give you what is the precise multi vector. So later, that part, if you want it, that is an involution and blah, 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 then you get precise invariants. And these invariants are those ones. Examples of this, they are in literature, few. If you have another different to the management ones, it will be nice. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, yes, yeah, comes from taking, for instance, okay vectors in this way. Okay, and then you play with the with R equal to one, equal to two, and then in particular for the rank greater or equal than three, you get some involutions, some geometrical involutions, with the pullback corresponds to the reflection map on on a particular class. And I will end this. I didn't understand how through the chamber of the decomposition you get the decomposition of the nice number of the number of the number of the number that you get an sorry again okay. in the in the statement there you said it's a nice number of things and you said the the two three terms of it can you work to the one drop thing so uh -huh. the option is that that you don't get something by asking about it but the nice number of things so how do you, I mean, this one is just for um, the decomposition of the cone is in terms of birational maps. Uh -huh. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. If I understood what you have said, <laughs> when you first, you have to, you, you have to prove that the, the wall that you were studying correspond to a divisorial wall or a flock wall. So you put some uh, conditions on the on yeah technical comes for a, a lattice that have this class b okay and this uh, result of Bayer and McCree say that if you study this uh, particular lattice that contains this uh, candidate as multi vector you uh, you get the different uh, possible uh, walls corresponding to the plopping disorient fake and blah 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 so that one's uh, give you what is the rational or why they are rational. So they give you all contractions, or so they, they're probably irrational. So I don't know if that's. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how in the end you get one and 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 one
I like that question. <laughs> I think you said, but I didn't. I think it's yeah, I I, I said it, but in words. So yes, um, you have a map here that is, for instance, it's a component, particular component in the stability manifold, and then here is uh, yeah, okay. You get here. Uh, and it's a, a stability points, then you associate here uh, elements in the code, right? So you are considered here at this composition. So you, you maybe have something here uh, at the composition of this manifold, okay? That this gives you some decomposition, some the cone, okay? So the point here is that if you are right, for example, Let's say that this is the point corresponding to my moduli space, okay? My birational model. So the first statement that they say is that you can arrive to another, uh, let's say here, <laughs> for instance, that you can arrive here to that true moduli space, but maybe on a different, uh, with a different Mokai vector, okay? And on the same K3 surfaces, or maybe on a, another K3 surfaces, which is derived equivalent to the previous one, just doing uh, some uh, crossing on these walls. Okay. And the point is that this, that was my candidate, the one that is by rational to X. And then I get my true moduli space in the other component. How do I get it? Just maybe by some operations on this wall crossing. Okay. So that's the result broadly speaking, of the Bayer de Macri, that all of these birational models from a modular space are, again, modular space, okay? So, yes, yes, you, you have to arrive to, to the good one. And even when you arrive to the good one, then, uh, yes, all of this is studying this, uh, this is a, con, um, a variation of this element here and here that uh, give you the right, uh, um, yeah, the, the right ample divisor, um, but that comes from the from the theory. From the another question. Mm. No. No. Okay, we put that here. Okay. Uh,